ladies and gentlemen. I hope you've enjoyed the morning session. Um, I appreciate you coming in um, to listen to what myself and Roy have to say for the next 20 minutes while you're eating your lunch. Please continue to enjoy it. Um, my name is James. I am the country head um, of the Hanbi Thailand. Um, I've spent the last four or five years working in Asia. Before my time in Thailand, I was looking after our business in Korea. Can you hear me okay? Okay, I'll try and project a little bit more. Um, and this is Rohit. I'll allow Rohit to introduce himself. Thanks, James. Uh, my name is Rohit Kumar. I lead the growth and development of Sociomantic Labs across uh, Asia Pacific. Um, and we'll have a slide about what we do uh, in, in a second. Before I joined Sociomantic, I spent uh, quite some time in Google in London. So I've been involved in uh, programmatic and um, sort of you know, watching display advertising transform you know, ever since RTB and all, you know, all these buzzwords have been around. I joined the company in uh, 2013, uh, based here in Singapore for the last couple of years. So I think before we get into our presentation, I'd love to do a quick poll uh, to get a sense of our uh, audience today. So uh, can you please raise your hands if you work for an agency? All right, thank you very much. Uh, and raise your hands if you work for a brand or an advertiser. All right, if you guys in the room, welcome. And uh, please raise your hands if you are a solution provider, an ad tech company, or a data provider, so of course. All right. OK, thank you very much. It's always good to get a sense of uh, who we are speaking to. I think we have a really good mix uh, today of all, all three. Yeah, so allow me to introduce Dunhumby, for those of you who don't know it. Um, we are a customer loyalty company, so we capture data from a variety of retailers around the world. Uh, you can see them all here on a nice global map. So in total, we've got um, over 660 million um, customers who we can get a specific read on. So we understand um, what they buy, we understand where they buy it from, and we understand how they buy it. Um, we look after over $500 billion of retail spend globally. So we have a phenomenal read and understanding of the global customer landscape. And across the world, um, in more than 30 offices, we have over 3,000 people working for us. Um, in different guises. We've got loyalty data experts, we've got consultants, um, and we've got general managers, people like me, who have a general understanding of everything we do as a business. Um, now, back in 2014, um, we came together with the sociomantic business. We came together because both businesses have the customer at the heart of what they do. So I'll allow Rohit to introduce a little bit about what sociomantic does. Okay, so Sociomantic, we were founded in Berlin back in 2009. So as I said before, we've been involved in uh, programmatic for about six years now, you know, back from when you know, RTB was just three ran random letters. Now it's just, a, you know, I think we, in, internally in our company, we have a sort of a wager going on. How many times do we go to a conference and see you know, the words like big data and RTB programmatic, how many times are they mentioned? So it's, I think it's become, uh, it's gone from being a buzzword to being sort of common speak. Uh, but in terms of what we do, we, we focus on full service uh, display advertising. Uh, we are live in about 70 plus countries, 74 countries to be precise, across uh, 21 offices. So we've invested heavily into, into Asia from 2013. So we opened offices in uh, Mumbai, Singapore, uh, Jakarta, Ho Chi Minh, Taipei, Bangkok, um, and Shanghai, and Delhi as well. So that's eight offices. Eight out of the 21 offices are in, uh, are in APAC. So I think that's also sort of gives you a sense of, um, you know, without going into any revenue numbers or anything, as to how topical and how quickly the market has, uh, has adopted um, programmatic as media becomes more addressable. Um, so yeah, we... Um, Dunhumby acquired us, at, I think it was April 2014, and I think together we're, um, I think we have a really unique offering in terms of bringing in the sort of the rich insight that uh, you know, Dunhumby brings in with point of sale data and shopping data, which we'll get into later on in the presentation, um, along with everything that Sociomantic spe specializes is on the, on the offline side. So the, the promise really is to, to bring the offline and the online pieces together, which is why um, we've, we've come together. So, yeah, that's Sociomantic in a, in a nutshell. I'm sure you've all seen communications a bit like this. Um, I'm sure we've probably all received them into our inboxes at some point over the course of this morning. 
Um, they're annoying. I won't ask you to um, put your hand up and tell me how annoying you think they are. But this is actually a perfect example of a communication that, from a customer perspective, it leaves you feeling pretty empty. Um, pretty much like the guys who are communicating with you are just trying to sell something. They don't really care about um, what it is that makes you tick as an individual. They don't care about um, what your preferences are and what sorts of things you're into. They just care about the traditional sale. Um, so the Dunumbi ethos is, of course, trying to put data into these types of communications to make them feel more personal, to make them feel more relevant. Um, and we'll take you through over the next few minutes how the future and the, the history of data is dictating that the future is going to move away from this type of communication and more towards personalized communications. Um, Dunumbi was founded in 1989, so the 80s was famous for big hair. We're moving to a world of big data. Um, over the last 26 years, um, Dunumbi has built up a phenomenal database of customer understanding. Back in the 80s, mobile phones were big bricks. Um, they, the Sony Walkman was all the rage. Um, and now, customers carry around everything in a smartphone. Um, smartphone growth uh, in the last year alone has increased 30%. Um, and as customers move through these more complicated channels of communication and consuming media, it actually creates more and more data points, which makes our job um, as agencies and brand owners more difficult to communicate directly with the customer. Not only that, but actually the pace of change and the rate of change is varying by region and even by market within each region. So if you take Asia alone, I'm sure you're all aware that half of the mobile phone users exist in the Asia-Pacific area in the world. So that's about 3 billion um, smartphone owners, um, which is pretty phenomenal. But if you then look at the actual split across the market, so if you take smartphone penetration in South Korea, it's an emerging market. I worked there for two and a half years. From 2011 to 2013, Smartphone penetration in Korea moved from, I think it was around about 23% to 73%. So nearly three quarters of all customers by the end of 2013 had a smartphone, had access to online mobile data. Where I live right now, Thailand, was 28% in 2011. It's currently today just over 31%. So the rate of change in the same area is dramatically different. And if you don't have data, if you don't have customer understanding, it's very easy to implement strategies that actually don't take into account all of that dramatic variation across different customer types, regions, and preferences. So customers have changed, um, and they've changed quite dramatically. Um, so customers have moved into an area where they expect to be understood. They expect brands to communicate with them in a way where you understand what makes them tick, you understand what they like and what they enjoy. They want to be treated as individuals. Um, they're surrounded by content. They're surrounded by media. They're consuming media faster than ever before. We all sit in meetings now and we consume media. Some of you will probably be doing it right now. You read the headlines. You read the news. Five years ago, people were not doing that. We do it because we can, because we want to, because we enjoy it, and because it makes us actually better and it makes our life more enjoyable. Um, Customers like to be engaged through their preferred channels. So some customers like to engage on tablets. Traditional customers still like to go in store. They still like customer shopping experience. Where I live in Thailand, that is a huge part of the service sector. Customers still like to go in and buy their products from someone they trust and they know. And they are less interested in interacting with technology, although they still do that in central areas like Bangkok. And Frequency. So you've got to be respectful. Customers don't want to be bombarded anymore with lots of communications. You've got to get the timing right. And again, if you've got data points that understands how often customers interact with what you do, you can start to be a little bit more clever about how often each individual customer should be communicated with. Yeah, I think um, just going back to a sort of uh, the partnership between Sociomantic and, and Don Humby, uh, you know, one of the things I think that's really beautiful about this is Don Humby has been doing um, for 25 years what Sociomantic's been doing online for the last six. So I think we have uh, pretty much uh, a shared mission statement, if you will, uh, which is to make um, to make advertising more more relevant, right? So 
know, the question is, how can you, you know, you talked about those, uh, those data points, but how, how can you have that one-to-one -one conversation uh, with your customers, but actually do that at scale, right? So we talk about, you know, different touch points, um, activating various data sets, whatever that might be, you know, your, uh, your consumer is buying a product actually in store uh, at point of, stay, uh, point of sale in, in various shops, uh, and also interacting with your brands uh, with your websites uh, and your EDMs, right? So think about the multiple touch points. So I think, um, so at least for us, we, we definitely see the future of all um, media, not just display or, or, or search that we are familiar with on the programmatic side. I think media generally will become more addressable, but I think this, this combination really lets us uh, do some real special things, and we'll talk about a couple of examples as we uh, go, go along in the, in the presentation. But I think, um, Sort of going back to the consumer, James talked about um, sort of you know what's changed in in, in 25 years. I think for us, um, you know, as as marketers, there's just two shifts that I think we should uh, master to sort of stay ahead uh, in this sort of an age where you know competition is just a click away, right? So we'll talk about both these points. So one is the the changing customer journey, um, right? So if you go back to years ago, you would think about your uh, a, a standard sort of a purchase funnel as being very linear, right? You would go through, you know, awareness, interest, consideration, purchase, um, and that's the way you would approach your campaigns as well. So I think we all know uh, that with the with the multiple touch points that 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 journey has been disrupted. It's not a simple linear process anymore. Um, and James will talk about that in a in a second. The second piece is is the absolute disruption we are seeing in the media landscape. Um, I just managed to catch a couple of sessions this morning. Again, there was, there was talk about programmatic on TV, programmatic on outdoor as well, I heard. So I think, uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of disruption in the way in which media is bought and sold. Um, and that, again, ties in really nicely with, um, you know, with the, with, with the, with the first piece, um, which I think puts us on a journey towards uh, what we call seamlessness, right, which we'll, we'll, which we'll explore. So I think we should go into uh, the changing customer journey, James. Yeah, the change in customer journey is quite difficult to kind of explain and summarize um, in the very short space of time that we've got. So we decided just to make a very messy slide, um, <laughs> which kind of helps you understand a little bit of the mind well, works. That, um, that big data is. The, the non-linear customer journey has uh, become very, very non-linear. And there's a bunch of stuff that doesn't even fit, fit on a slide, and this is all aggregated data. Um, and really, it's turning into a matrix, and this is why big data has become um, such, such a big term. There is, there is tons of data, and up until 2003, uh, I need to get my numbers right, but it, but it was roughly 500 billion gigabytes of data the world has created um, since we were able to measure data consumption and usage. Um, you roll the clock forward to 2011, we were creating all of that data in the space of 48 hours. So all of, all of the world's data that we created up until 2003, we were creating in a 48 hour period, which is pretty scary. Um, as it stands today, we're probably creating that amount of data, 500 billion gigabytes, um, in a six hour period. By 2020, we'll be creating that amount of data um, in less than one hour. So there's loads and loads of data um, and it's becoming more important now to understand how each individual customer is interacting with all the data points. And actually, we're going to move towards a world where it's not about big data and just collecting 500 billion gigabytes of data every hour. It's about understanding the importance of each different type of that data and then how to use it. So I guess today we're probably going to start coining the term smart data. Um, and, and using all of that data in an efficient way to actually understand more about how each individual customer is going through their journey and how we can help enhance their shopping trip and their path to purchase. Okay, so I think uh, the second piece on, in terms of the, the changing media landscape, we can probably go into the, the next slide. Uh, I, think what's, I think the biggest piece here is, is actually the role that programmatic um, has had on, on addressable media. So I think... Um, you know, one thing that I always say in conferences like this is uh, I think the industry is really guilty of you know, jargonizing this whole business far too much, right? There's just, I mean, the sheer number of three-letter words that's, that's used sometimes seems like you're abusing the, the, the audience with, you know, RTB, DSP, SSP, I could, I could go on. But I think um, 
if, if, we, if you think about the points that James has just made about the, um, you know, the, the nonlinear uh, customer journey, the multiple touch points, um, juxtapose that with the fact that we, you know, we operate in these uh, live spot markets. Um, so I think you know, if I take a step back and actually break down a concept like real-time bidding, which you know, many of you would have heard in conferences like this or, 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 or in the trade press, I think essentially what we are seeing is we're seeing that we have um, access to this massive sort of a live spot market where you could just go, go in and buy, buy inventory right, in, in, in real time. And fundamentally what real-time bidding would do is it gives you as a marketer the, the option to, to cherry pick when to serve an ad, when not to serve an ad, uh, based on the variables associated um, with, with, with that. But I think the, the biggest, the sort of the trend related to that is we're seeing for the last few years, we're seeing a shift from uh, content being a proxy of, of interest. So let's say you're, you're running a campaign for, I don't know, Audi or a car company, you would say, hey, you know what, I want to run advertising um, across the 10 biggest car sites um, in, in Singapore or whichever you know, uh, geo you were targeting. Um, and I think that, that is, I mean, of course, there is still value for that, but that, uh, you know, today what we can do with tech is we can also figure out who are in-market car buyers and have a communication with them, a relevant um, sort of a communication with them whilst they're reading content that may not necessarily be auto-related. But we know that they as users are interested and probably in-market to, to, to buy a car. So I think um, programmatic uh, you know, really enables us to do that. But I think one big difference is, is data, right? I think as, especially as, as marketers and agencies, uh, you know, as you speak with multiple solution providers, uh, access to inventory I don't think is, 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 a, is a big deal anymore, right? I mean, I personally believe that we will have consolidation, so you would have, whether, whether that's Facebook or Yahoo or Twitter, whatever that might be, that access to that is not going to be the big issue. The question is, what are you going to do differently? How do you activate inventory that everybody else uh, has access to? And, and that's where data comes in. That's where you know, data, which is um, something that's unique to you, that's proprietary to your business, uh, really comes in because this, uh, you know, this way of buying helps you enable that, uh, you know, power, powering media buying, using your own data. So I think we'll explore two, two, two themes in terms of how do we get to that, um, you know, get to seamlessness, because you know, I think we all know what happens if you have sort of generic messaging. We used to call it spray and pray. Um, you know, one size fits, fits all. But I think you know, the, the point we want to talk about is um, big data is not necessarily the answer. Right? I think we, we hear about big data all the time. Um, for us at, at Sociomantic and certainly at Dunhumby, um, you know, we say the focus should more be on, on smart data. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you, you know, what, what we mean by that. I think the best way to explain that would be with, with a couple of examples of what's now possible with, uh, through our partnership with, uh, with Dunhumby. So you know, we, um, it's not a, a public case study yet, so I might have to anonymize it. So we work with a, uh, an FMCG brand uh, that's looking to launch a, a new product, a hair care brand. Um, and I think you know, previously, if you think about, OK, let's say you have a, a shampoo that you want to launch in market, and there's all of the stuff that you would do, uh, let's say, on, you know, on, on, on TV, print, and uh, press, but there's, in terms of the activity you would do online, the ways in which you would buy that um, might be similar to what I've just said before, right? Sites uh, or topics that you think resonates with, with, with that audience. Um, but I think going back to data, what we can now do is we can actually look at um, store data from, uh, for example, in, in Thailand with, with Tesco Lotus. We can actually isolate uh, a bunch of folks who have bought a similar product. So this is actually point of sale data. We know that they have bought a, a hair care brand at, that, at this price point over the last six months um, and actually run a, a targeted sampling or a couponing campaign just focusing on these guys. Because we know that they, you know, there's a, their take-up rate would be higher. Uh, they are definitely interested in, in, this, in this product, which I think makes things like uh, upper funnel and um, sort of branding campaigns um, far more relevant uh, because that coupled with uh, the fact that we can measure it, right? We can also measure what really happened uh, in terms of how many of those guys actually ended up activating the voucher and how did that compare with, with other stores nearby. So I think, you know, if you, if you start thinking about the possibilities of taking that point of sale data and the loyalty segments that, let's say, Dunhumby already has and activating that online, um, the, the opportunities are really um, uh, endless. And that's on the, on the branding side. And I think another example I would give on the, on the performance side is um, it's a campaign we have um, with an e-commerce company uh, that has a sort of a no quibbles, no questions asked returns policy. 
right? So you can buy a product on their site, and if you don't like it, you have, um, if you change your mind in a week, I think you have 10 days to return the product. So, so these guys came to us and said, hey, you know what, you're doing a great job. Um, however, we know that you know, a certain percentage of our customers end up returning the product for, for whatever reason they change their mind. Therefore, you know, we are paying to acquire these customers when they actually end up returning the product. So again, the role of data here was we said, OK, that's, that's fine. Is there a way in which you can get this data across to us through a, um, through a feed uh, via the, the API uh, through which they could tell us which are the customer IDs that have a history of returning products? So again, going back to this live auction, now when we see these users and we know that, OK, this guy sounds like he's, he's in market to buy the product, but we know that there's a 50% chance that he would return the product. So we would run that campaign on a much low gearing, uh, take on a far more aggressive sort of a performance goal because we know that converting the customer is not going to be good enough because they might return the product. So I think when you think about big data, think about, think about um, data that you can actually activate in, into, you know, into the media markets, data that's already structured that you can go out um, into this addressable media and, and activate. So things like your CRM data, your, your loyalty information. Um, so I think there's a combination. There's, there's stuff that you already have, and there's um, you know, things we can do with, with, with our partnership with, with, with people like uh, with, with Dan Humby, uh, for example. And this is you. It's me. And I think we've got about a minute left, so I'm going to try and um, wrap up, probably by using the example, actually. So using big data, turn it to smart data, one of the ways that we've done that actually in Thailand is we've, we've taken a huge emerging trend in the Asian marketplace, which is convenience, which is emerging so quickly and so dramatically. If you actually look at a heat map of Bangkok five years ago versus today and the number of convenience stores that are occupied in that space, customers have actually redefined what convenience is. If you'd have straw polled them five years ago and said, what does convenient look like? They'd have probably said there's a store two or three miles away. Now they think it's convenient if there's a store 100 yards away. So what we've done is we've taken the data in Thailand to understand how customers are shopping those convenience small store formats to help them range and change the merchandising display within each individual store. Because some stores customers find it convenient because they want to go and buy a soft drink because they're thirsty. And other stores customers actually want to go in on their way home because they're going to do some cooking and they want to pick up some leafy green veg on their way home. So we've used data to kind of change the range of merchandising within our stores. And I think today we want to leave you with, with a summary, which is um, to drive customer loyalty, um, hopefully the points up on the screen around understanding the media landscapes and the fact that the consumers have changed dramatically over the last 10 years. Um, the customers actually and the consumers want a more relevant, rewarding and personalized experience. And actually combining art and science, which I guess is kind of what me and Rohit are trying to do um, by standing up here today, gives us the potential of unleashing a, a winning formula for, for the years ahead. Yep. Thank you very much. <laughs>